body of Christ to, uh, to celebrate what God has done on our behalf. You know, and certainly, you know, we think about worship, and sometimes we think about what we do here, but, uh, you know, worship is something that takes place everywhere. It's not just here. But there is something special that happens when we gather together. And I'm so thankful that I have the privilege to gather with you today. And I, and I trust that you're here, and you, you desire to not only worship God, but also to learn more about His Word. And as we, even as we learn uh, about His Word, and we begin to apply it, we live lives of worship. So, welcome back. We're in this series... Um, that we've been doing through James. Can you believe we are on week eight? I know, it seems like it's going by pretty quickly. At least I feel like it's going by pretty quickly. Maybe you think it's taking forever. Why don't we get done with the book of James? We still have some more to go. But we're on week eight uh, of this series. We've talked about a lot of different topics uh, in this series. And in fact, our logo actually kind of points out some of the different topics and some of the, the different things we've talked about. And it's kind of a visual reminder you know, uh, we, we start out talking about, you know, with the cross, talking about maturing in our faith. And, and James starts off, uh, starts off talking about how do we mature in our faith. And, and, and sometimes it happens through trials. Sometimes it happens as we overcome temptation. Oftentimes it happens when we not only hear God's word, but we do God's word. Um, so uh, being a uh, hearer of the word and, more importantly, a doer of the word. So we talked about maturing our faith. And then we progressed from there. We kind of did a little mini-series uh, talking about faith and works, faith and deeds, which is one of the main topics of the book of James. And we've said throughout the series that it's, it's not what you know, it's what you do that matters. And that's one of those things that, that James talks about quite a bit, faith in action. So we talked about how, how we're not supposed to show favoritism. Uh, and, and, uh, and then we also talked about uh, faith and deeds. We talked about, last week about taming our tongue. How many of you worked on that this week? Taming your tongue. Taming your tongue. Yeah, yeah. Because you all subscribe to my wonderful invention, Verbacheck, right? No, not yet. Yeah. So uh, we still have some work to go there on taming the tongue. Well, today we begin kind of a brand new section of talks. Um, in the book of James, and so we're, we're going to kind of switch gears to, to the different icon, we're going to be looking at the globe. We're going to be looking at the globe, and, and the reason why we're looking at the globe is because of, because of all our missionaries. No, that's not it. Um, but we're looking at the globe because we're reminded of, of there's two different worldviews that, that we kind of view life through. Our, our worldview, what is our, our worldview? It's, it's basically the lens from which we see reality. It's how we see things in life. That's where our worldview is. Our worldview kind of um, helps us to make decisions. It's, it's, it's our value system. It's our beliefs. All of those things go into our worldview. It's, and, and as Christ followers, we should have a different worldview than those who don't follow Christ. We should see things differently, and we should do things differently. The, the reason is because our worldview is deeply shaped by God's Word, which is filled with wisdom and insights as to how to live life in a way that is not only pleasing to God, but it's, but it's also a living life in a way that is, that is helpful to us and encouraging to the people around us. So our worldview plays a big part in how we see things and, and how we do things and how we react uh, to the things that, that we face on a daily basis. So today, go ahead and turn to James chapter 3. James chapter 3. Uh, if you're using one of our Bibles, it's page 979, 979. If you don't have a Bible, feel free to take that one home with you. We'd love for you to have it. 979, James chapter 3. Now specifically, today what we're going to be talking about as far as our worldview and these two contrasting things is we're going to look at two different kinds of wisdom. Two different kinds of wisdom, and they come from two different contrasting worldviews. This, this is a, a really easy question. I'm going to, I like some participation. But how many of you sometimes lack wisdom when it comes to making decisions? Yeah. I think every hand. There, there, we, we always have things that, that we struggle with. You know, I'm not sure. Should I do this? Should I do that? Should I buy this? Should I buy that? Should I go here? Should I go there? Should I hang out with this person? Should I not hang out with this person? You know, oftentimes we have such conflicting thoughts about what we should do in life. By the way, just a, a real, real quick one. Um, in, a, in a few weeks, we're going to talk about knowing and doing God's will. So there's going to be a little bit of overlap between this week and that, that week here in a few weeks. Because James also talks about knowing God's will. But let's face it, sometimes we lack wisdom. We lack clarity as to how we're supposed to live our lives. And so it's important that we look to the right places for wisdom. 
And what complicates things even more is that these two worldviews that, that we kind of have, they're both whispering in our ears telling us to do the opposite thing. What is that? You know, you're like, man, should I do this? Should I do that? And, and you, you're, you're kind of hearing two different things. The, the, the reality is this, that Christianity in itself is countercultural. It goes against what most of, or much of, what our society tells us to do. So we have two different worldviews that are kind of battling each other. It's countercultural. In addition to that, sometimes living for Christ is just counterintuitive. It goes against our very nature uh, to do some of the things that, that Scripture tells us to do. God's principles sometimes go against human nature, and our human nature is the default nature that we were born with. Did you know that? If you were born a human, you have a human nature. Right? And so our default nature sometimes sets us up for failure. And so somehow we need to kind of tame that. We need to, we need to come up with a different way of thinking. So Christianity, or following Christ, is both countercultural and counterintuitive. And this is why we really need wisdom that rises above ourselves and it rises above our culture. And that's what James talks about here in James chapter 3 when he talks about two different kinds of wisdom. So let's, let's read this and then we'll come back. And, and discuss it a little bit. James chapter 3, beginning at verse 13, says this. Who is wise and understanding among you? <laughs> That's a great question, by the way. That's not for you to answer right now. We all know. If, anyway. uh, who is wise and understanding among you? Let them show it by their good life, by deeds done in the humility that comes from wisdom. But if you harbor bitter envy and selfish ambition in your heart, do not boast about it or deny the truth. Such wisdom, quote unquote, does not come from uh, come down from heaven, but is earthly, unspiritual, demonic. For where you have envy and selfish ambition, there you find disorder in every evil practice. But the wisdom that comes from heaven is first of all pure, then peace loving, considerate, submissive, full of mercy and good fruit, impartial and, and sincere. Peacemakers who sow in peace reap a harvest of righteousness. And he, he kind of closed that out, like, listen, if we want to have, have a harvest of righteousness, if we want to have great things going on outside uh, or, or all around us, you know, then, then we need to kind of think about things differently. So he kind of gives us some motivation at the end. We want, to, we want to reap a harvest that is a good harvest, a righteous harvest. So if we want to reap a good harvest and a righteous harvest, then we've got to think about things. We've got to perhaps do things differently than the way culture and society tells us and the way that we kind of sometimes have a natural bent towards. So in this text, he contrasts these two different kinds of wisdom, heavenly wisdom and earthly wisdom. We're going to look at both of these contrasting ideas from these different worldviews, and then we're also going to give some examples of each of them, and then we're going to kind of conclude our time today with, this, with trying to figure out how do we discover heavenly wisdom? Before we kind of get into all of that, I want to give you just kind of a, a simple definition of wisdom. And it's, it's not necessarily a definition as much as that it's, a, it's a quote about wisdom, but it is kind of a definition. It's this, that wisdom is knowledge rightly applied. Wisdom is knowledge rightly applied. I think that's, that's a pretty good descriptor. I mean, it's not going to be the, necessarily the definition you find in the dictionary. But I think it, it really has some, some great insights. See, sometimes we think wisdom is the same as knowledge. Oh, that person has a lot of knowledge. They're a wise person. Not necessarily. See, wisdom is more than just having all the right facts. It's more than just having all the right information. It's more than just knowledge. But it is knowledge that is rightly applied. It's the application of knowledge. Remember, we've said throughout the series that it's not what you know, it's what you do that matters. So wisdom includes us actually doing the right things and not just knowing the right things. You've probably heard the phrase, knowledge is power, right? Maybe you've heard that. Dale Carnegie said it this way, that knowledge isn't power until it's applied. You know, if you have all the right information but you don't do anything with it, that's not really wise. It's not what you know, it's what you do that matters. In fact, here in verse 13 of James chapter 3, when James introduces this subject, he describes a wise person this way. What's he say in James 3.15? He says, who is wise and understanding among you? So he's kind of asking this question, trying to get our attention, right? Who is wise and understanding among you? And then he says this, let them show it. 
Let them show it. By the way, that's kind of a theme throughout all of James. Don't just tell me. Don't, don't just give me the right answers. I want you to demonstrate it. I want you to show it. Don't just, sh don't just talk about your faith. I want you to show me your faith by what you do. So he tells us this when it comes to wisdom. Who is wise and understanding among you? Let them show it. How? By their good life. By deeds done in the humility that comes from wisdom. So the, the wise person demonstrates their wisdom by what they do. This wisdom should be observable. It should be provable. It's not just a, a person that is wise in theory, but it is somebody that is wise in practice. So he tells us, let them show it by their good life, by deeds done in humility that comes from wisdom. So if you want to kind of even summarize that, that last little phrase there, a wise person does the right things for the right reasons. They do the right things for the right reasons. He says, let them show it by what they do, by their deeds, by their good life, as doing the right things, not so that they can draw attention to themselves, but they do this in humility. So they do the right things for the right reasons. So let's talk about these two different kinds of wisdom uh, and, and hopefully by the end we'll be able to kind of wrap our minds around this a little bit better. The first kind of wisdom that he talks about is earthly wisdom. Beginning verse, uh, at verse 13 again, he says, Who is wise among you, or uh, wise and understanding among you? Let them show it by their good life, by deeds done in humility that comes from wisdom. And then verse 14 says, But, so here's a contrasting word, he says, But if you harbor bitter envy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not boast about it or deny the truth. Such wisdom does not come down from heaven, but is earthly, unspiritual, demonic. For where you have envy, selfish ambition, there you find disorder in every evil practice. That's the complete opposite of the righteousness, or the harvest of righteousness that we want to see, right? So he's contrasting these things. So what do we learn about earthly wisdom? Here's, here's something for your notice. Earthly wisdom is self-centered, and short-sighted. Earthly wisdom is self-centered and short-sighted. Let me explain what I mean. First of all, it's self-centered. James says that this kind of wisdom that comes from envy and selfish ambition is earthly. He uses these two, these two words, envy and selfish ambition. He's, he uses those, uh, those words twice in, in just these three verses. And he's saying, listen, earthly wisdom is all about us. It's all about our own advances, or our own advancements. It's about power, it's about success, it's about materialism, it's about acquiring things. Earthly wisdom is all about self-preservation and self-promotion and self-interest. It is all about us, and it is self-centered. Doesn't that kind of describe much of the, quote, wisdom of our world? You need to have all of this stuff. You need to make all of these, this, this advancement. You've got to have all of this stuff. It's all about you. You're the customer. It's all about you. James tells us, listen, that type of wisdom is self-centered. That's not heavenly wisdom. And then James tells us in verse 15 where this kind of wisdom comes from. Verse 15 says, such quote-unquote wisdom, love the quotes there, such wisdom does not come down from heaven, but is earthly, unspiritual, and demonic. So he uses these three words to kind of describe this kind of wisdom. It is earthly, unspiritual, and demonic. This self-centered wisdom is short-sighted. And I, I, I'm saying it's short-sighted because it's all about here and now. It's all about, it's all about me, and it's all about now. It's short-sighted. It doesn't look to the future. It just looks at self-gratification. What can I have, and what can I have now? Maybe a year from now, maybe five years from now, but that's still not long-sighted. It is still short-sighted. It's all about here and now. It's not heavenly. It's not eternal. It's temporary, is what he's saying. In fact, he says it's temporary by saying this, this, this phrase that it's earthly. This earth will pass away. The things of this earth are temporary. They will fade away. Listen to what Jesus said. Jesus said, uh, in Matthew 6, 19, he says, Do not store up for yourselves treasures, where? On earth, where moth and vermin destroy, where thieves break in and steal. But, another contrasting statement, 
But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where moth and worms do not destroy, and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. You know what he's saying? He's saying, listen, if you're so focused on the things of this earth, you're going to make some wrong choices. If your wisdom is based on your own self-interest, and it, it's, it's really short-sighted, it's only focused on what is temporary. And if we want to be wise, we're going to think about things that are way beyond us and way beyond here and now. Then he says that earthly wisdom is also short-sighted in this way, that it is unspiritual. He says it's unspiritual. What's that mean? It, it, it just means it's godless. It's without God. It's without the spirit of God. It's doing things apart from God's spirit. This unspiritual wisdom doesn't see and doesn't accept the guidance that comes from the spirit of God. All right? So it's short-sighted. It only sees what it wants to see. It doesn't see things beyond itself. It doesn't see what God sees. Which, by the way, is one reason why I, I love, you know, the Lord's Prayer, the Disciples' Prayer, where it says, Our Father who is in heaven. You know, when we think about our Father who is in heaven, He has not only all of heaven's resources at His fingertips, but He has, also has all of heaven's perspective. He sees what we do not see. That's why when we pray to our Father who is in heaven, we were, we're asking God, would you give us insights that we don't currently see? Because we don't see the big picture, but you do. You're sovereign, you're in control, and you are all-knowing, and you see all of this. We need your wisdom. We need heavenly wisdom. But if something is unspiritual, it is lacking the Spirit's input. It is lacking discernment. It's lacking the wisdom that comes from the Spirit of God. Earthly wisdom does not look at life through the lens of Scripture or see things through heaven's perspective. Then James says that this kind of wisdom is also demonic. Now that's a pretty strong word, right? It's like, whoa. It's like, you know, unspiritual, you know, earthly, demonic, really? It's, it's of the devil? You know, you, you've probably heard people say, well, that is a lie from the pit of hell, right? And maybe I heard that say, that is a lie from the pit of hell. It's usually with an accent, that is a lie from the pit of hell. You know, I'm not sure why I just, it's not always with an accent. And that wasn't a very good accent, so sorry. It's not in my notes. Um, but, you know, it's, it's something that is demonic. He's saying, listen, this earthly wisdom is, is demonic. It, it doesn't come from God. It, it comes from another source. It's of the devil. And, and as I'm thinking about that, I'm, I'm thinking about, okay, so how does, how, how does the, the scriptures describe the devil? How does the scriptures describe Satan? That Satan is a great deceiver, right? He's so clever. He's so crafty. He, and he, he makes things appear to be better than what they really are. He overpromises and underdelivers, which is what sin does. That's what Satan does, too. He overpromises and underdelivers. And when we fall for his kind of, quote, wisdom, we find ourselves longing for more because, you know, what we just got didn't satisfy the need that we thought we had. It's demonic. Satan is the great deceiver. Scripture says that, that <coughs> Satan is, disguises himself as an angel of light. It looks appealing, but it's, it's false. It's not true. It's harmful. And Satan has mastered the art of deception. And he makes his wisdom look appealing. He makes his wisdom look justifiable. How many of you are, have ever justified a decision that you know you probably shouldn't have made, but you're like, I'm going to do it anyway? Yeah, uh, that's pretty much all of us. Yeah, it's like, well, you know. Yeah, we justify things all the time. See, Satan has master the art of deception. But we need to remember that Satan is a liar. This is what he does. It, you know, I don't know if he does it for a living, but or whatever that means. But this is what he does. It's something that he is excellent at. He is a liar. Listen to what Jesus says about him. In John 8, 44, Jesus says this. He says that, that he, talking about Satan, he was a murderer from the beginning, not holding to the truth. For there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks his native language for he is a liar and the father of lies. Jesus, how do you really feel about Satan? You know? It's like, I think, I think that he doesn't love the, the, the plan that Satan has for us. Right? He says, listen, he is a liar from the very beginning. And that should take us our, our minds back to Genesis chapter 3, what happened in the Garden of Eden. And, and you know, Satan is so crafty, and he goes up to Adam and Eve and says, hey, look at this. You know, look at this. And earthly wisdom says, oh, it's desirable. 
It looks good for food. It is desirable to make one wise. You know, that's earthly wisdom. They looked at it and said, oh, it looks good for food. You know? You know, we talked about this a few weeks ago when we talked about, you know, temptation is the lust of the flesh, the lust of the, um, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. All of those things kind of feed into our earthly wisdom. It's our human nature. It's our sin nature. So when he says, listen, this is that demonic, this is that, that thing that is kind of, that we wrestle against all the time. This temptation that we face. From the very beginning, he has deceived mankind into making even the most foolish decisions, looking, uh, making them look appealing. See, earthly wisdom is self-centered and it's short-sighted. Let, let me give you just a, a few examples. Let me give you a few examples of what I'm talking about. And some of these you'll recognize. How about success is the ultimate goal? Success is the ultimate goal. You know, if, if I can just chase after success... You know, I'm going to do whatever it takes to, to be successful. I, I need to pursue the American dream. I, I need to have all of this stuff. I need to somehow keep up with the Joneses. By the way, Joneses are over there. Try to keep up with them. All right, so also not in my notes. Sorry about that. Uh, you know, so we've got to we've got to pursue all of this kind of stuff. And if I can just be successful, then I've arrived. And human wisdom says pursue success at all costs. What about this one? Life is short, so live it up. YOLO, right? You know, how many of you said YOLO sometime in the last week? YOLO? And some of you are like, YOLO? You only live once, right? You only live once? You know, it's... Okay. Maybe I'm the only one that says it every time I'm not supposed to be eating something that I... Well, you only live once, right? You know, you only live once. You know, I'm just going to cheat on my diet for this month. <laughs> you know, just this one month. Well, then we've got Christmas. We might as well wait till New Year's. I'll start my diet again at New Year's. Right? Because we justify things and we talk ourselves into bad decisions all the time. YOLO. You only live once. Right? Life is short, so live it up. You know, that's kind of what human wisdom says. Or how about this one? This one kind of stings a little bit. Being busy means that you're important. You know, I mean, we wouldn't say that. You know, hey, I'm busy, I'm important. No, we wouldn't say that. But I find myself... You know, sometimes I'm just feeling so busy. I've got so many things to do. I must be important. I mean, if I, if I were to go up to some, somebody in the mirror that asked, hey, how have you been? I'm like, you know what? I haven't done anything this week. <laughs> they would be like, you're lazy. You're, you're not important. You know, but to, but to say, man, I'm doing all of this stuff. I must be important. Human wisdom says it's all about me. That I'm the customer. You know, and, and I'm right. It's all about me. Everything should focus and revolve around me. Human wisdom says the ends justify the means. It doesn't matter what I have to do as long as I get what I want. Once again, we wouldn't necessarily say these things, but we live differently. We live according to some of these principles. How about this one? Bigger is better. Newer is better. You know, if I can just have the newest, the latest, the greatest, I've got to have this. And it kind of goes back to that materialism thing. <coughs> It goes to the, to the comparison track. Well, oh, they have this. Well, I should have this too. That's human wisdom. It's earthly wisdom. How about this one? Time is more valuable than people. Of course we wouldn't say that. But our actions tell a different story sometimes. I'd love to help this person out, but I've got stuff to do. I'd love to serve here, but I can't. I'm a busy person. I've got stuff to do. What are we saying? We're saying that you know, my time is more valuable than this person. Do whatever you, do whatever makes you happy. Do whatever makes you happy. You know, and sometimes we have this philosophy, you know, I just want to be happy. And I just want my kids to be happy. As long as my kids are happy. And I'm not down on happiness. But if that's the way that we live our lives, then we're focused on the wrong thing. We're focused on us. And that all revolves around pride. Remember, pride is that thing that got Satan kicked out of heaven. Pride is that thing that he loves to instill in each of us. It's that thing that he kind of stirs up. And most of these things, it's not all of them, kind of all revolve around pride. Right? Disagree with me and we'll move on. Yes. yes. All right. Well, yes. Well, okay. Tough ground. See, earthly wisdom is self-centered and short-sighted. Let's talk a little bit about heavenly wisdom. Heavenly wisdom, verse 17 says this, says, but, there's that contrasting word, but, I want to contrast earthly wisdom and heavenly wisdom, but the wisdom that comes from heaven is first of all pure, then peace-loving, considerate, submissive, full of mercy and good fruit, 
impartial and sincere peacemakers who sow in peace reap a harvest of righteousness. So James gives this contrasting description between earthly wisdom and heavenly wisdom. In fact, he lists out these eight words and he kind of describes heavenly wisdom. And, and I kind of want to summarize it this way. First of all, we've looked at earthly wisdom, the self centered and short sighted. So heavenly wisdom is God focused and others oriented. Heavenly wisdom is God focused and others oriented. Listen to how he starts out verse 17. He says, but the wisdom that comes from heaven is first of all pure. Uh, I just want to camp out there just for a, for a minute. He uses this phrase, first of all, and he's not just trying to get our attention, even though he does. He's not just trying to list the first thing in the list, even though this is the first thing in the list. When he says first of all, he's saying, listen, everything else I'm about to say is based off from this first thing. It is, first of all, highest priority, everything else kind of comes out from this, is first of all, pure. And all of the other characteristics come out of this first characteristic. So when I think about purity, it is God-focused. God is pure. God is holy. God is righteous. All of those things stem from this, this idea of being pure, that, that God is holy and righteous and pure. So our wisdom, if it's going to be heavenly wisdom, it is God-focused. It needs to come from this purity. In fact, all of these characteristics of heavenly wisdom stem from the, from the attributes of God. Heavenly wisdom is God-focused. It is God-centered wisdom. Years ago, um, people wore these bracelets uh, that said WWJD. Anybody remember that? How many of you had a WWJD bracelet? See the real Christians. I'm just kidding. I'm just, I'm just kidding. We just know what area you grew up in. Yeah, WWJD, right? You had those, those bracelets. This stood for, what would Jesus do? What would Jesus do? And, and the whole principle, the whole idea behind that was just kind of a, a, a visual reminder to think, you know, what would, what would Jesus do? What, what would God do in this moment? And really the whole idea behind that is, you know, I lack wisdom, I lack discernment or clarity, so what would God do? It's all about heavenly wisdom. You know, having the, the wisdom to make the right choice, having the discernment to, right, to make the right choice no matter what situation. It's not just, what would I do? Or what have I done in the past? Or what would I like to do right about now? But what would Jesus do? What kind of heavenly wisdom do I need? So heavenly wisdom is God-focused, and then it's also others-oriented. Verse 17, he says, But the wisdom that comes from heaven is, first of all, pure. Then, what is it? It's peace-loving, considerate, submissive, full of mercy and good fruit, impartial and sincere. That is a great list for somebody else, right? Now, it's a great list for us to consider when, when we're trying to make decisions. What if we were to run our decisions through that filter? That would probably eliminate some of our, some of our, our questions, wouldn't it? We would have more wisdom if we could just go through that checklist. And I'm saying it's others-oriented because if you look at every single one of those things, it's saying, listen, it's not about me. It's about somebody else. It's others-oriented. It's putting other people first. When you think about the first word, he says it's peace-loving. So when you think about you're having, you're having this decision that you have to make, and, and, and you're like, you know, should I choose this or should I choose that? You could ask yourself, will this decision promote peace or will it lead to disunity? Once again, if you're not liking this, this is scripture. All right, this isn't my list. This is what, what God says. You know, some of these things are challenging. You know, because we have earthly wisdom that says, you know, peace loving, no, they, they did me wrong. I want to get back at them. That's what I want to do. That's what I'm going to do. I think I should. And we justify some pretty bad decisions when we do that. That's not heavenly wisdom. So he says, is it peace loving? Is it considerate? This is the opposite of something that is self-seeking. This is the type of wisdom that puts others first. Is it submissive? Submissive means it's willing to yield. It's, it's, it's reasonable. It's flexible. It's willing to listen and to, and to change for the sake of others. It's full of mercy. That's, that's the complete opposite 
of earthly wisdom is false mercy. See, for us, you know, when we think about earthly wisdom, earthly wisdom is fool me once, shame on you, fool me twice, shame on me, right? There's no mercy in that. So heavenly wisdom says, listen to that. You know, when in doubt, I'm going to err on the side of grace. When there is no doubt, I'm going to err on the side of mercy. It's full of good fruit. Good fruit, verse 18, kind of tells us a little bit about what that fruit looks like. Verse 18, he says, peacemakers who sow in peace reap a harvest of righteousness. That's the type of good fruit that we should be striving after. So the heavenly wisdom asks this question. It asks, you know, if I do this, will it produce good fruit? If I do this, will it produce righteousness in my life? If I do this, will this produce righteousness in somebody else's life? Is it going to produce good fruit? Is it impartial? Is it free from prejudice? Is it free from favoritism, partiality? Heavenly wisdom is sincere. It is without hypocrisy. It's genuine. It's authentic. See, this is a pretty incredible checklist, isn't it? When we're searching out wisdom, God give us wisdom to know what to do in this situation. Maybe pull this list out once in a while and say, well, how does it, how does it measure up? You know, if we really want heavenly wisdom... See, earthly wisdom and heavenly wisdom, they come from two opposite worldviews. 1 Corinthians 13, or 1 Corinthians 9, let me start over. 1 Corinthians 3.19 uh, says this, For the wisdom that is of this world is foolishness in God's sight. They're complete opposites. See, earthly wisdom is self-centered and short-sighted, where heavenly wisdom is God-focused and others-oriented. Let me give you a few examples of heavenly wisdom. Now, some of these may sound familiar. Uh, you know, pretty much all of these are just things that you find directly in Scripture. All right? Here's a list. It is better to give than receive. You know, Jesus said that. It's better to give than receive. That's an example of earthly wisdom, or of, of heavenly wisdom. It's counterintuitive. We think, well, it's better to give some stuff than it is to give away stuff. How about this one? We save our life by losing it. When we, when we give ourselves to Christ, when we lose our, 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 ourselves and say, God, I want to submit myself to you, that's when we actually find salvation. That's heavenly wisdom. What about this one? Love your enemies. That's not something you're going to find in our culture. Right? You're going to find the opposite. You're going to find hate your enemies. You're going to find beat your enemies up, take your enemies out. Heavenly wisdom says love your enemies. Heavenly wisdom says pray for those who persecute you. You know, earthly wisdom says, you know, get back at it. Don't just take it. Get back at it. Heavenly wisdom says, rejoice in your sufferings. You know, we looked at that at the beginning of the series, the trials and temptations, right? And we're going through trials. Rejoice because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Perseverance must finish its work so you may be matured, complete, not lacking anything. We rejoice in our trials. In our sufferings. How about this one? The first will be last, and the last will be first. Right? That's countercultural. That's counterintuitive. We like to put ourselves first. How about love your neighbor as yourself? Man, if we loved our neighbor as ourselves, our neighbors would be so loved. Wouldn't they? Because we really love ourselves. We take care of ourselves, we provide for all of our needs in many, if not most, of our wants. Do we do that for our neighbors? Heavenly wisdom says this, to be great, you must be the servant of all. That's what Jesus said. See, it's counterintuitive. It's countercultural. It doesn't make sense when you compare it with what we're kind of fed all the time in the way that we kind of are, are naturally wired. In fact, I mean, you could go on and on and on and on with that list. In just looking at the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus frequently said these words, You have heard it said, but I tell you. What is he saying? He said, listen, this is, this is what conventional wisdom would tell you, right? This is what earthly wisdom would say. But i I, I got a better system for you. Over and over again, he tells us what heavenly wisdom really is all about. It's counterintuitive. It doesn't come natural to us. In fact, it's supernatural. Is supernatural. That's why God says, listen, my thoughts are not your thoughts. My ways are not your ways. By the way, I'm thankful for that. 
I'm thankful that I was created in God's image and God wasn't created in my image. That's why we need heavenly wisdom because it doesn't come from us. It has to come from outside of us. So how do we get this? How do we get this heavenly wisdom? I think that's a great question. I'm glad you're all asking that question right now. Yeah, so what do we do? How do we get this? Well, this is not an exhaustive list. Let me just give you a couple things. Here's, here's a couple questions that you can ask. Question number one is this. What does God say about this subject? You know, so whatever, whatever the issue is, you know, what does God say about this? James 1, 5 through 8 says this. If any of you lacks wisdom, you should ask God, who gives generously. So he's not stingy with his wisdom. Who give generously to all without finding fault. And it will be given to you. But when you ask, you must believe and not doubt. Because the one who doubts is like the wave of the sea, blown and tossed by the wind. That person should not expect to receive anything from the Lord. Such a person is double-minded and unstable in all they do. So if we're lacking wisdom, we need to go to God and, and ask Him for it. Ask God for wisdom. He says, when we do that, when we trust that he's going to provide that, that wisdom and those answers. And when we trust him, not only with the answers, but also with the outcome. And we apply the things that, that we learn and the things he's telling us to do. He says, listen, I'm going to give you that wisdom. By the way, do you know where the, the vast majority of the wisdom that we need for life is going to be found? This is a Sunday school answer, so. It's the B-I-B-L-E. Bible, that's right, good job. Um, Jesus, Jesus, Jesus is in the Bible, yes. Yeah, the Bible, you know, God wrote a book, did you know that? He wrote a book, number one bestseller of all time. And there's so much information in there, so much wisdom to be gained if we would just look up the answers. You know, in this life, which is just this incredible test, right? It's an open book test. And he's given us his word so that we can discover truth about ourselves and truth about our world and truth about our circumstances and how to respond to the, to the issues of life. It's an open book test. So we should ask God, God, what do you say about this subject? And when we're looking for wisdom, we go to him first. And when, not if we lack wisdom, but when we lack wisdom, let's ask God what he thinks about the subject and then pray for the courage to act on the wisdom that he provides us with. Because let's face it, sometimes that's, that's the difference between knowledge and wisdom. Knowledge is we give the right answers. Wisdom is we actually do something about it. Wisdom is we apply it. So sometimes, I know for myself, I need more courage than I need knowledge. Because oftentimes, Oftentimes, I know the right thing to do. I just like the courage to do it. The second question is this. When you're not, so you're not sure to do, to do, you're not sure, and you want heavenly wisdom rather than earthly wisdom, here's a tough question to ask. This is not going to be a very fun or popular question to ask yourself, but this question. Who wins most with this decision? Who wins most with this decision? So imagine you're stuck between a couple of options. You know, if I make decision A, this is what happens. If I make decision A, it's good for me. But if I make decision B, it's good for somebody else. That's a really tough question to ask ourselves, isn't it? And it's not going to be a popular one, but perhaps, perhaps, not all the time, but perhaps, God just revealed something to us about what we should do in a given situation. And I'm getting that from this idea that, that heavenly wisdom is God-focused and is others-oriented. It puts the needs of others ahead of our own. See, heaven, heavenly wisdom puts God's agenda above our own agenda. Heavenly wisdom places the needs of others ahead of our own needs. Heavenly wisdom says you first rather than me first. It's because heavenly wisdom is both counterintuitive and countercultural. See, choosing heavenly wisdom over earthly wisdom can seem so strange and foreign, especially in the, in the culture that we live in. But let's not forget that while following Jesus may seem irrational and even irresponsible at times, God calls us to live up to a different standard. 
He calls us to live up to a higher standard, which is modeled for us throughout the pages of Scripture. And over and over again, you read about men and women that did something that just seemed completely countercultural, completely counterintuitive, and yet that was the thing that God rewarded most. Over and over again, we see that. Things just didn't seem to make sense. Remember when Gideon was facing against the Midianites and there were like hundreds of thousands of them? There, I mean, you couldn't even count them. And God said, listen, you have way too many men for, for me to deliver the Midianites in your hands. You need to get rid of some of them. All right, we'll get rid of a whole bunch of them. And a whole bunch of them left. He said, hey, if you're too afraid and you don't want to go fight, just go ahead and you, you can leave. You can go home. Okay, fine. You still have too many. And God narrowed it down to 300 people. That doesn't make sense. That doesn't make any earthly sense. Oh, you're going to conquer this city? Well, you've got to march around the city. Really? We're just going to walk around it? Oh, not the last time. You're going to march around it multiple times, and you're going to yell. Oh, okay. Now that makes sense. See, there's over and over again. Oh, you're going to send out a, a teenage Jewish shepherd boy to, to go up against this. Uh, go up against uh, a, a Goliath, a giant, and whoever wins, you know, they get to control the other nation. Now, that doesn't make sense. God's word is filled with examples of heavenly wisdom that doesn't make sense. And it may seem foolish to, in the eyes of a watching world, but it's not foolish to God. And I pray that we'll be men and women who trust Jesus completely, even when it seems foolish even when it goes against conventional wisdom. You know, as I was thinking about this idea of, of something being irrational at times and sometimes being perceived as foolish, I was reminded of the story of Jim Elliot. Perhaps you've heard it before, but don't let this slip past. Jim Elliot was labeled a fool because of what he and his friends did. They were missionaries to a barbaric tribe of Indians known as the Alka Indians in Ecuador in the 1950s. And they went there because this, this is a group of people that needed Jesus. They needed the gospel. And yet this very group of people was, was a group that was known for, for, for just being ferocious. They were known for the high murder rate. They were known for spearing each other. They killed each other with spears. They were barbaric in so many ways. Untamed. And Jim, Elliot, and his friends, they knew that God was calling them to share the gospel with this particular group of people not knowing what the outcome would be. And to much of the world, what they chose to do based on God's calling seemed foolish. Jim Elliot famous, famously said these words, perhaps you've heard them before. He says, He is no fool who gives up that which he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. So when everybody else is saying, listen, this is foolish, this is a foolish decision for you to do this, you're going to put your life in jeopardy. You're going to put your family's lives in jeopardy. You're going to lose it all. Jim Elliot said, listen, I'm not a fool. He is no fool who gives up what he cannot keep. What, what are the things he cannot keep? All of these earthly things that so many of us strive after. He says, I'm not a fool to give up all that kind of stuff because I can gain something that nobody else can possibly take away. The salvation of souls. And so... I mean, that, that makes a great Facebook post, right? That makes a, a great phrase to put on a calendar or to put on, on your refrigerator. But this is something that he believed. And it's something that he did. And it's something that he died for. <coughs> See, that type of wisdom cost him and his friends their lives. But we also need to recognize that that very action led to the salvation of many, many people. And has led to, including some of the people that killed these men, gave their lives to Christ as a result of their powerful testimony. In addition to that, their quote-unquote worldly foolishness, right, has inspired hundreds of thousands of people throughout the world to live for Christ no matter what the consequences are. See, there's a vast difference between Heavenly wisdom and human wisdom, or heavenly wisdom and earthly wisdom. Which one will we choose? May we be men and women who look to heaven for wisdom while living here on earth. And rather than living these self-centered, short-sighted lives, 
May we focus on God and the other people that God has put into our lives. And through it all, may God receive the glory because he alone is worthy.